Now we're moving on to Nebraska for our next case. This is where new DNA evidence has been revealed in the gruesome murder of Sydney Loof. This is the young woman who disappeared after going on a date with someone that she met online. Sydney Loof went missing on November 16th of 2017 after setting up a second date with someone named Bailey Boswell, whom she met on Tinder. Now the family said that Sydney had been depressed. She was unhappy with her job at a local grocery store, and she was also broke. So that sets up a picture of what's going on in Sydney's life, which is important if you look at being taken advantage of, right? Someone who's vulnerable, which I think is very, very important in, in, in this case. So on December 4th of 2017, her body was found. And this is what I don't understand, Danielle. So there were 13 pieces of her body in separate locations around the county in this area of Clay County, Nebraska. They were wrapped in plastic trash bags and dumped in ditches along gravel roads. And the way they initially finally identified that it was her was through a tattoo. Mm -hmm. So here's the other part I'm having some trouble with. I know what you're going to say. The prosecutor said that none of her organs were found when they did the autopsy, absolutely missing from her remains were all of her organs. That's like, that's really sick. It's a lot. And I know we'll talk about it, but there was the, the anatomy (sighs) book that was also found, which will certainly be evidence the prosecutor will use. Oh, my goodness. So also found at the crime scene, a sex toy, a dog leash, wads of duct tape, plastic sheets that were smeared with blood. This is really bizarre. The sauna suit, you know, like one of those things to sweat in with the crotch cut out. And what's okay? So then let's get back to the the date. The last time we know anyone saw Sydney alive. So. She went out with Bailey Boswell, who went by the name of Audrey on Tinder. Boswell lives with a man who's named Aubrey Trail. Boswell and Trail were seen at the Home Depot hours before that time period in which Sydney disappeared. Okay, they were seen purchasing the following items. A hacksaw, tin snips. What do you do with those? A utility knife, drop cloths, and here's something else that's so bizarre. On that same day that they went to Home Depot, they um, the the it, this would be like the boyfriend. All right, does it does a walk by right? Does a drive by of where of where um Sydney mm-hmm. lives? It works. Excuse me, works. I, it, it's sounding a little premeditated here, obviously. And then they go through the phone records um, and they start finding a lot of weird, weird stuff going on. So they get a search warrant for the apartment that Trail and Boswell live in. OK, right. This is the couple. Um, and it seems like this couple just lured poor Sydney out for a very disturbing Oh, my Lord, what they did to her as part of like what they said was a play acting of a movie that turns out to be a snuff film. It's where do I go with this, Danielle? Unsurprisingly, it's a basement apartment, (laughs) which you can't make up. Um, But, you know, I have to say, I, I do love the way that you're talking about this and the way that the news articles are, because there's absolutely no shaming of the victim. Right. There's no. Because people, adults can engage in consensual sex, right? And and sort of whatever kinks they want. This is not that. This is someone who was taken advantage of and who was a victim. So I think at the very least, we can step back and be thankful that we're living in a time where there's no victim blaming here and where we can really look at this and say, "This, this was not, this was not that. Right. If people, if adults want to use Tinder and want to live their life, great, go for it. This obviously is not that. 
Right. And what we'll never know is to what degree Sydney wanted to participate in this kind of a sexual experience. To what degree did she go along with it? Um, and at what point did it turn from a consensual sexual experience into and then to murder? Right. And the defense, the boyfriend and the girlfriend, right, who lured Sydney, th- their defense has kind of been, hey, um, things got a little out of hand and she wasn't supposed to die. And that's what happened. And we're really sorry. And that shouldn't have happened. So I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. There were a few things that I think people might be interested in from the other side. Why is this happening this way? Right. So criminal defense attorneys cannot decide whether or not our clients will testify. It is absolutely up to the client. So that's a constitutional right that they're guaranteed. I can say, please, please, please don't. I'll, I'll even tell you a little, a little detour. When I was a public defender in Manhattan, I had a client accused of indecent exposure and, 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 and lewd, basically lewd acts in public. And I was a baby lawyer and it was just a bench trial. And the young police officer, also a new officer, was too shy. So I kept asking him about my client's penis. Because he had to testify that. They had to establish that it was exposed and that he was acting in a sexual way. And he, would, he couldn't say, he couldn't talk about it. So I knew I was going to win because they need to prove the case. And at least in my head, the judge says to me, you know, okay, the prosecution rested. Are you going to rest, counsel? In other words, don't... don't Stop snatch, while you're ahead. <laughs> correct. Don't snatch a, what do they say? Defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, So I turned to my client and I said, sir, I truly believe we're going to win. Please do not testify. It is your right. Uh, You may, please do not testify. He insisted on testifying and walked up to the stand and his pants dropped. And we all saw what the police officer was too scared to testify about. Uh, I will say in the end, um, that wasn't enough. We, We still got a not guilty on that one. But In this case, I'll bring it back, I promise, Uh, what uh, Aubrey, right, the the boyfriend, his defense might just be something that he thought of. And his lawyer, we don't know, might be sitting there saying, please don't do this, please don't say this. But it's absolutely up to him. And sometimes uh, when we do have, you know, appointed clients, we want to do the best that we can, but there are some clients who won't talk to us. So that's why trials are the most exciting thing in the world, because this might have been a surprise to the defense team also. Because you never know when someone's going to drop their pants. Correct. Correct. Okay. And and that was quite an experience, I bet. It really was. You know what? And clearly your client had a thing where he needed attention. That's why he was doing what he was doing. Hello. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Let's get back to this case. Acquitted. That, <laughs> acquitted. <laughs> You're an excellent attorney, clearly. <laughs> um, so when the police go to search the apartment of where the couple lived, they said that the, the landlord explained to the police, it's like, you know, there's been a really strong smell of bleach the last few days. Ding, 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 red flag. Investigators then found the hatchet Um, a package for that sauna suit, as well as cameras, zip ties, and they found a book called The Human Body Atlas. Now, ordinarily, that book is not so bizarre, but it is bizarre if if the victim's organs are missing and why they'd be missing. It's definitely on the list of things that you don't want found at your murder client's house. Okay. But of all the things that were found, that seems to be like the least, um, you know, that would implicate. But nonetheless, yes, it, it does tell a story that there is a there is a picture that's building here. Then data from Boswell's two cell phones showed that she drove 200 miles back and forth to where the remains were all found. Right. Remember mm-hmm. that Sydney's remains were found all over the place. So then this is when we start getting the story about what may have happened. So Trail claims that Sydney was accidentally killed when they were filming a a consensual sex fantasy and that she was strangled to death 
And that's what really happened. And if that's what really happened, I don't think you had to go to all the crazy lengths of chopping her up and putting her all over the place unless you really thought that they'd never find her and that they'd never identify her. Right? Sometimes it's not the the best defense, but it's certainly what what he's going with. But I I think he did say, um, and, and I'm not saying this was the best way to go, but I think he did say, you know, I was afraid that no one would believe me. And didn't he tell yes. me if I'm wrong? Didn't he plead guilty to a lesser yes. crime? Um, yes. So it's weird. So in June of 2019, he pleaded guilty to improper disposal of Sydney's remains, but not guilty to murder or conspiracy. So, you know, the prosecutors are saying there's a whole, so that's, so he's saying, oh, it was an accident. I'm making a movie. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean to kill her because, you know, she just died. So really, yes. Did I bury her body parts? Yes. Right. I'm, I'm, I, I will tell you in the court that that's what I did. I did that. But prosecutors are saying, no, 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 no. That is not really what happened. They're arguing that he had planned for weeks to lure a woman via social media to try and kill. Now they're saying social media. I think it's funny. Sometimes prosecutors, depending on their age, think what they meant were dating apps. But okay. Um, or, you know, it's possible that they were, you know, profiling her already Who knows? through her social media. That's also possible. You know, he does admit that he choked Sydney with an extension cord as part of this um, sex movie that they were making. Now, during this murder trial, the defendant ends up suffering two heart attacks, two heart attacks and a stroke. As if there isn't enough drama going on here, right? There's like another side story going on. And then then something really bizarre happens. Uh, on June 28th, while in court, Trail suddenly speaks up and says, Bailey, that would be his girlfriend, is innocent. I curse you all. And then he slashes his neck a few times with either a sharp pen or maybe a piece of a razor blade. It was enough that he needed some stitches. It was more dramatic. It didn't really, it didn't really, you know, seriously injure himself. And it sure as heck didn't stop the proceedings in court. Ultimately, they bandaged him up and got him back in there. I'm going. Yeah. All right. So three weeks of really grisly testimony, viewing 500 pieces of evidence. The jury took less than three hours to come back with a verdict. He was found guilty. Trail was found guilty of both first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder in the slaying and dismemberment of Sidney Loof. But we're not done. We're not done. That's that's just one part, right? So So now... There is um, a current case, right? Because remember, so that's the guy involved in the murder, right? Charged with murder. And now his girlfriend, the one who met up with Sydney, her trial has now started. Okay, this is Boswell's trial. For all of you trying to keep up with all these names, I know it's really hard. So she's been charged with first degree murder as well. And her trial began September 21st, just last month. And during the ninth day of the trial, an FBI forensic expert took the stand and has brought in 155 pieces of evidence. So now what's coming out while this is still going on, a lot of the DNA evidence is now coming out and we're getting some information, which is really interesting because there are apparently 17 crime scenes because that's where all her body parts were were dumped and buried. And they have now found, they found at the scene like things like latex gloves and and all all of this. And it's matching back to Sydney. So all this DNA evidence that's just been entered just in the last few weeks is coming back as being connected to the murder. I just it's almost as if the case is actually growing. Like, it feels like there's even more evidence than there was for the first trial for the other defendant. So sometimes time is on the side of the accused because it can lead to a more fair trial and other times only more evidence uh, can be introduced. I, I did want to mention it's interesting that they're tried separately. And what I'm thinking about is what is Boswell's defense going to be? 
So the law allows for defense attorneys to move for separate trials. The case is called Bruton. Really, it means when a co-defendant's confession implicates the other defendant, they can't get a fair trial, right? So let's say you and I are charged with a crime and I confess, I say, I did it, but Anna did too. Well, that's not fair that what I said would be used against you. So in this case, it leaves Boswell completely open to do whatever defense she might, right? She might go a completely different direction. Certainly there's not a question that she was there. I don't think they can do an identity defense, but tell me if you've seen, I haven't seen which way her lawyers are going to go yet. I think they're still going through just the enormous amount of evidence that the government is bringing right now. Yes, the prosecutors are now presenting their case. So we'll be waiting to hear what the defense is. What's also interesting, you mentioned that they were indeed, yes, they've one has already been tried, the other one has her court hearing. What happened in the middle of all of this, because, you know, the first one was a circus, the boyfriend's circus trial. They've been trying to get coded messages to each other uh-huh. so they could come up with the same story when each came up for trial. Okay, now you really don't think anybody's going to pick up on that. I wish that we could read those letters. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they, because their code is probably so crazy that that's probably what caught everyone's attention, right? As the people at the jail are reading this, they're like, this letter makes absolutely no sense. It's completely incoherent. Ah, because it's a code. (laughs) Yep. There must be something to it. Yeah. So we're going to keep you updated on this case. We know it's very complicated, but at the end of the day, a woman was murdered because she met someone on a dating app and... She just wanted to do what it is that she wanted to do. And what they wanted was not what she had in mind. So let's hope there's justice. Certainly, I'm looking forward to seeing what um, Boswell's defense attorneys bring forward here. And of course, for the family of this young woman to have this be over and get to, to uh, as best as they can, given this horrifying situation, have some sense of an ending here. And I think that's what's really hard about what happened to Sydney, because not only do you have to find out what happened to your daughter and identify her through a tattoo because her body parts are scattered all over a county, but then you have to start hearing the, the lunacy coming out of, of the you know, people who are charged with murdering her, and then the antics in the courtroom with the standing up and the you know, slashing and the every, and then the heart attacks and the stroke. I mean, there's a lot going on there. And this family's just trying to get justice. And you've got a whole set of things that most people are not prepared to deal with. I, I, undoubtedly, I think very, none of us are prepared to deal with that kind of loss. And then to have to hear about how it happened and then for it never to be, to feel like it's not closing, right? To feel like, we can't at least bury her and, and move on is, must be torturous. Yeah, it really is. Okay, we'll keep you posted on that one.